Very nice to uh, be here and see everybody. And uh, uh, my my objective today, really, some quite a few of you will have seen at least some of these signs before. But my real objective today is to try and inspire some of the youngsters to uh, to think about moon bounce. And uh, and uh, you know, there's a there's an interesting project here, I think, for the university. Uh, um, the uh, the Norwegian as a Norwegian group uh, 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 in. Um, uh, Stavanger, I think, yeah, who've got a very active uh, EME operation going. But really, my emphasis today is going to be on the oh, wrong way. Is going to be on the, the microwave side. But I'm going to just begin with the uh, with the early history because uh, uh, you know I'm not a, I'm not ashamed to say that I was part of the early history, and um, you know I can still feel the excitement of uh, of, of those days and and uh, what we were doing. So. First of all, how does uh, early history, how does moon bounce work? Pretty short piece. And then really, what are the, what are the issues? What are the things in the way um, that we've got to think about and overcome? And then something about the, the systems and the components, and a very quick piece at the end on, on measurements. So where did it all start? Well, um, the, the, the first official moon bounce test was this US Army project. I'm not going to go through the whole slide. You're going to have to to uh, read fairly quickly. Um, but uh, it was basically um, it, it, at uh, VHF, um, a big array of dipoles, and that was 10th of January 1946. But interestingly, before then, um, January 1944, uh, and this is completely documented now in the history, you know, it, it's, it really did happen. The Germans had a system which I think was probably an instrumentation radar for Pina Mundi. Um, uh, um, I, won't, <laughs> I won't go into why. Um, <laughs> but the, the, so there's two big collinears, and, and so it got very narrow vertical beam, wide horizontal beam. So they saw the moon rising, uh, I mean radar wise, they saw the moon rising probably with some ground gain from the sea in front as well, and saw, and, and, and saw the echoes two and a half seconds uh, later. So, Rather interesting that it was there uh, beforehand. So, in the amateur side, <coughs> work started in the early 50s. These two guys um, were, were really keen, very keen, very notable experimenters um, W4AO, WF, KJ, KJP. Um, and they did manage to make uh, one way contact on 144 megahertz, lots and lots of big contacts. Sorry, big antennas were made at that time in attempts to make contacts at 144 megs, but it was a long time, in fact, before that happened. But of course, what was happening in the 1950s, and uh, those of you that were around in those days will remember this, it was so exciting, you know. I mean, there was Varactors, you know, Varactors appeared, lasers appeared. Everyone thought, well, what do we laser? That's interesting. What are we going to do with a laser, you know? Um, but, it's, but it was, but it was uh, an interesting thing to uh, to see happen. Um, so parametric amplifiers became possible um, up to a few gigahertz. Basically, this is, an, this is a negative resistance amplifier using a reactor diode pumped at, uh, um, at frequencies uh, uh, 10 or 15 times the the, uh, uh, the frequency you're trying to amplify. So microwave associates still around today. Had paramps, IMAC had klystrons, big klystrons, get some dishes, and we came on. And the picture is Sam Harris, who I regard as the father of, certainly he's the father of microwave moon mounts, and uh, he's changing his, his feed there or getting to his feed on probably about the most unsafe feed access system <laughs> you could think of inventing. Anyway, so this is what happened. This QST, which I still have, dropped through the mail, and oh my god. You know, somebody's worked uh, a, a fire the moon across the states, and everybody, all, all the people who are working on meteor scatter and long distance drop over and that sort of thing, started to say, So, you know, how can we do that? What do we need? How can we build a big antenna? Um, how do we generate the power? How do we appoint it? Etc. Etc. Well, there were lots of dishes built, but there were, it was a long time actually, it was two years before there was another contact on 1296 fire the moon because. You know, it wasn't easy to get these things together. It wasn't easy to get anywhere near a, a low enough noise figure. 
um, find a dish, etc., etc. Um, there were no computers to point them, so it was basically pull them out and look up the nautical almanac in the library um, to uh, to know where to point it. Now my first contact was uh, oh sorry oh, my first <laughs> contact was June uh, was, uh, point anyway June 1964 uh, using the Arecibo dish and um, so I've, I've highlighted the 1296 one so the. So the first European contacts on 1296 were 1960, 1964, and this is the um, this is the dish um, in uh, Arakaibo which you probably have seen before. How do I point with it? How do I click on middle the button thing at the there? very top? Mm? Middle button at the very oh, top. All right. Okay. So if I go, oh, I need to. Oh, I can touch on the screen. That's no, that didn't work. I was trying to play the recording. Oh, sorry to... Yeah. Uh, Don't worry. Leave it for now. If we, as we're short of time, we'll be in the Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Right. So this is our archive over here. Okay, yeah, just put it on just a little bit of it. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, that that was. Uh, we suspect that we were using about two kilowatts into 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 a thousand foot dish. There was a lot of a lot of signal. Anyway, uh, press on. So so I was ready for this because um, I had a I built a fifteen foot dish. Um, in uh, in um, about 90, well, just after the uh, just after the moon bounce, uh, um, uh, the first moon bounce was done in so it's probably 62 or something like that. Anyway, and um, uh, and so I was ready for that uh, that KP4 BPZ thing when it came on. Um, the dish got upgraded. Uh, that means there were bits of wood joined across between the arms to steady it to work on 23 uh, 23 centimeters with a a circular guide feed, and I made my first 23 centimeter contacts in uh, 1968. And this dish is an example of what I call Blair's Law of Dishes, and that is that whatever frequency you think it will work at, it'll actually work at about three times that. <laughs> and, uh, just try it. <laughs> this dish uh, was uh, was made of wood. Um, it was uh, it lasted 23 years. It made of uh, marine ply. It was moved a uh, location three times, uh, worked up, this one worked uh, quite successfully at 13 centimeters. And that's what I have today. Um, it's, uh, <coughs> and this one, this one will work up to uh, uh, 5760. Um, can I do, no, I'm, I'm not gonna bother with the, with the recording, it's basically my sideband networks. So, so moon bounce, so is it really as simple as it, as it looks? Well. In some ways it is, but there are things that can trip you up. Um, this is a slide that goes back a long, long way, but the reason I, uh, uh, the reason I have it and, and uh, uh, SWX uh, turned it into this form for me, used to be a view graph, is basically it's got all the components. Um, you know, these, oh, these, well, you've got it, okay. So we've got the transmitter power, we've got the loss in the, in the transmit feeder, power at the feed, up to the moon, through the atmosphere through the ionosphere, reflected from the moon, 6.5% reflectivity, quarter of a million miles back to the earth, received at the, at the uh, dish feed, noise from the ground, loss in the, um, in the, in the feed between the, in the feeder between the preamp and the receiver. So all, the, all of the elements, all of the elements are there. Don't worry about the, uh, the, the equations there for a moment. Um, so now, uh, there are only, really only two equations that we need for successful moon bounce. One is the radar equation, and I, I, I suspect you, 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 the students can work this out um, you know, as a little exercise this evening uh, over a beer. Um, it, you can do it all from the inverse square law, if I remember rightly. Um, but the, the, the key thing is the antenna gain, transmitter power obviously, but the system temperature. So so, oops, sorry. 
So, so maximizing g over t is the real key. What we're trying to do all the time is improve g over t. The, the uh, second important equation will come, come later on. So on the path from the transmitter to the receiver detector, there's a number of things that, that, uh, that affect the, the signal. Um, path loss, which <coughs> we'll talk about in a moment. Well, we're going to just have a few words about most of these. Polarization change. Um, Ionosphere straight losses, we can forget about it because we're talking about microwaves. It really doesn't happen there. Time delay, well, we know what that is. Um, we're going to talk a bit about Doppler shift and spreading. And finally, of course, noise. So path loss, first of all, and this is really very interesting because <coughs> it's sort of counterintuitive in a way. Higher frequencies give much better signals. And that is because the, 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 part, the average path loss you can see um, in, the, in the second column here, right? But the dish gain, uh, uh, sorry, so the path loss increases <coughs> as 1 over f squared. The, sorry, uh, that's f squared, what am I talking about? Um, uh, the words, and the dish gain, um, increases as, as f squared, but the dish gain comes in twice because it's there. If you're talking about echoes or somebody else with the same dish gain at the other end, so the, the, the net remaining loss goes down. So for the same, the same power, the same size dish, the same system um, temperature, the signal actually gets better as you go up. Now, what actually happens, of course, is that losses start, start to to bite you and you can't get enough power and, and so on and so on and so on. But there is no doubt the, the, um, you know, the, on my system, the best echoes are at, are, are at 13 centimeters. Best sideband echoes are at, uh, 20, at 13 centimeters. Magic band for uh, EME, but sadly a bit split up. So we go the wrong way out here, I'm sorry. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, uh, polarization change. So there's there's two sorts of polarization change. There's geometric change and there's Faraday rotation. So um, so the, the geometric ch change. If you if you uh, at, uh, if you look towards the uh, sorry the sit let me start again. The signal reflected off the moon comes back if we transmit horizontally it comes back horizontally here, 90 degrees away around the Earth. It comes back in the in the orthogonal polarization. So you transmit vertical, it comes back horizontal, and, and vice versa. So you know there's there, there is a there's a there's a potential um, uh, problem there. Um, the other thing, of course, is that um, Faraday rotation will will introduce a uh, a rotation a change of the polarization. Um, but that, that um, reduces as frequency squared, and it's negligible above, above 23 centimeters. So if we use circular polarization, we don't, we don't have to worry about whatever residual Faraday rotation there is, neither do we have to worry about geometric um, uh, polarization change. So the standard was set up pretty early on to use, uh, to use circular polarization and that gives us also an advantage that we can easily separate the transmit and the, and the receive um, signal because we transmit up on one polarization, polarizations re re uh, re reflected from the moon comes back in the opposite polarization. So you go in on one side of the feed and out on the other. Which I'll show you that uh, later on. So on the thread lesson, losses, we can forget about that. Time to leg, we can forget about that. Doppler shift. Um, Slide missing somewhere. Oh no, I know where it is. Um, so Doppler shift and signal spreading. Well, Doppler shift. I'm sure everybody is familiar with Doppler shift. Just think of the you know the, the, the train whistle. Total Doppler shift is the sum of each station's individual shift, but it varies slightly because the moon's orbit is not uh, not circular. The relative velocity varies, and so you get something called uh, libration fading. Um, you don't notice this at low frequencies, but at micro frequencies, it does come in and it causes spreading. Um, so this shows you the sort of, of Doppler shift. Um, uh, this is out. This is minutes from moonrise, I think, or something, something like that. Um, 
are on there, but, but the transit is that central, um, where it crosses the central axis. Um, so 70 centimetres, there's not much, um, 6 centimetres, there's quite a lot. But notice this, that at, at this point here, there's a point of inflection, and at this point here, there's a point of inflection. And that is a point where the system is, is sort of stationary, and it can be amazingly stationary, you know. Um, um, even, even at six centimetres, you'll get fading, fading durations of a minute, you know, which I, I, I still can't really get my head around how that can happen, but, but, it, but, it, but it does. Um, now this one I really would like to play, Derek, is it possible you could do this? So, um, this is, um, this is a signal, this is Spectran, and so you can see the, the signal here, and it's from um, a, a, a station in Czechoslovakia. Um, and if you, if Derek, you can play that, you will hear the, 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 the fading. I meant to say liberation. See, so it's a wide signal, it's not a pure tone. And that's quite mild vibration. It can be quite a lot wider than that. And I can see John nodding his head there because he's heard three centimetres of signal as well. Okay, that's your point there. Thanks. Great. Okay, thanks. That's great. Yeah. So you can see you, you can see the spreading of the signal here on the on the spectrograph, and that uh, Charlie calculated it out as about 78 thirds of of um, Spreading. So that's something that um, you know, uh, has to be taken into account. It, do, it does mean that on some of the um, some of the higher frequencies where people are using uh, uh, higher microwaves or people are using digital modes, they try and pick points when the vibration is at a minimum um, uh, because there's less um, there's less effect on the modulation at that uh, at that point. So now we've got to talk about noise, so, uh, uh, because noise is uh, obviously something that uh, comes in with, with, this, with the signal caused by the random <coughs> motion of electrons. We all know this bit. Absolute zero, there's no noise. Noise is, is KTB, K is Boltzmann, B is, is fixed. So we can just talk about noise in terms of temperature. We call it noise temperature. So, Deepest outer space is close to zero K. Well, it's not actually. Uh, I'm sure, again, you, you all know the remnant of the Big Bang gives a background of about 3.4 degrees Kelvin. And um, this was discovered in 1964 by Penzias and Wilson, who got the, the Nobel Prize for it. And this was the antenna they used, which is really interesting. <coughs> I, I, I saw it. I saw this because I was actually there at, at Palmdale around about this time, but basically it's a horn with a parabolic um, uh, end to it. So it, and they're very, very low noise antennas. But, but you know, they calibrated everything in the system several times over, they kept on coming up with this three and a half degrees Kelvin missing, and then realized what it, uh, what it, what it must be. Um, so, so we've got noise, which is picked up by the antenna, uh, together with the with the signal, um, and that's what we're going to look at next. So, so this is this is a Gunhilly antenna because it's a nice one to be able to draw lines on um, my PowerPoint skills, which are not great. So basically, here's the antenna. Here's the feed system. The antenna is looking up at the sky, so we've got the the background uh, radiation. You know, we've said three, three point four four. If you um, at some frequencies um, lower down, it's much higher, um, as we'll see in a, in a moment. And the amount of noise that comes in, the temperature that the, the antenna sees, uh, or the feed sees, effectively, is dependent on frequency and elevation. There's also noise that comes in here from the ground, because some of the energy from the feed misses the dish and hits the ground. 
flip that round, reciprocity, noise, noise power from the ground goes into the feed by the, by the edge diffraction of the dish and by, by bits of the pattern that, that uh, miss, the, miss the dish. Now, um, you minimize this with a good feed design, and it is small, but the ground is pretty hot. So 300 degrees K, we're looking up here at 3 degrees K, so we really want to avoid uh, seeing ground as much as, we, as much as we can. So this is what the sky temperature looks like um, with frequency. It's elevation dependent, and around here, around this bit here, uh, uh, one and a half, two gigs. This sort of uh, up to up to three. This is the, uh, the you know the magic window before water vapor starts to come in. This is 30 degrees elevation. It goes down a bit for for 90. Goes somewhere down to uh, to about here. Um, <clears throat> and of course, at lower frequencies, you've got um, you tend to be getting a galactic contribution. This is what it looks like drawn on a. Um, a chart that has um, a right ascension against declination. So, so black is quiet, um, purple is, is, is hot or yeah, somewhere around there. So the moon at this point is in a nice quiet part of the sky. Um, it tends to go like this. So in, in, uh, in Australia they tend to uh, you know, have more problems with Sagittarius than we do. We do, we do here. Um, Cassiopeia is is right up. Whoops, Cassiopeia is right up here. Occasionally, the moon goes through Taurus, goes through this bit here. But we're sort of fortunate being in the northern hemisphere. I always think. Um, so we talked about uh, noise being picked up from the antenna. We're now going to talk about <coughs> noise generated by the any lossy components in the in the receiver system <coughs> and noise generated by the amplifier. Now, this is, uh, I want to illustrate this with this system of uh, OZ, Peter OZ1 um, LPR at three centimeters. And here is, here is the feed horn, right? This, sitting here looking into his offset, his offset dish. So we're looking down now on the feed horn. Um, Here's the transmit side going into that side of his, uh, uh, his uh, circular polarized antenna. The receive signal comes out here. So he's got a relay which is just there to protect the low noise amplifier from any leakage across from the transmitter. And there's his low noise amplifier. So the, the signal path goes through the relay and through these, these, these elbows into here. And the, the important thing is, let me just, I'm sorry. The important thing is that you've got to remember that those those components uh, there, those the relay there, they're at room temperature. They're at 300 degrees or two, 290, 290 degrees Kelvin. So any any loss in those is generating noise, uh, you know, which is proportional to 290 degrees Kelvin. The the horn is looking at three degrees Kelvin. So you know this is an area where um, paying real attention to getting these losses down pays very big benefits. So now the, the, the low noise amplifier, so these, uh, this is a, um, a low noise amplifier designed by, uh, by Sam, G4DVK, very successful. Um, I mean, at, at, at um, 1296, At 1296, uh, 0.24, oh, lower, 0.22, you know, really low noise figures. I'm not going to convert that into temperature, but we'll, we'll, we'll touch on it, I think, later on. Um, and this is um, a 13 cent one. This is the clever bit. There's a, a transistor here, which is almost impossible to deal with because it's got little tiny tabs on it and not leads. But you know, 13 centimeters, 0.3 of a dB noise figure. I think mine's about 0.3. Seven, something like that, and then if we go on here, um, I just put this in. This is a this is a six centimeter preamp. And you see, a lot of this stuff you can actually build. You know, it's not it, it, you don't have to buy it, um, especially if you want to get right right down to the uh, to the lowest possible. 
So this is a six centimeter um, uh, low noise amplifier. It measures 0.65 of dB. Uh, it's got about mm, you know, not amount of gain. I think about 11 dB, something of that of that nature. And then here's the three centimeter low noise amplifiers. Um, there's there's one here. There's a, a dB6 NT. DB6 NT um, one here. Sorry about the poor photograph on this one. I didn't do a terribly good job. 0.7 of a dB noise figure. The the guide it, it, the guide input is un, underneath there on the on the lower side. But but this thing here is a slightly modified um, LMB, a very very ancient one. Um, but they are they are still around. And uh, this gives one dB noise figure. Um, you know, okay, it's not quite as, quite as good as this, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper. And you can modify LMBs quite, quite easily to, uh, uh, to get them to work. Um, just the amplifier part of the, of the LMB, uh, get them to work at just about three centimeters. But, you know, I think what I want to emphasize is the really big change in the, in the 50 or so years is between, is, is the receiver side. That is, that's where the, you know, I was using 300 watts when I made my first, um, first EME contact on 23 centimeters. I'm now using 400, but the signals are sidebound rather than scraping uh, the bottom of the noise. Um, the, the, the parametric amplifier that we used in those days, um, as I said earlier on, um, there, were, there was, uh, there's a 723AB cluster on underneath there. Um, Pump, pumping the diode, the Bracta diode up to 10 gigs. Um, the, the idler, which is the difference between the uh, signal and the, and the pump frequency, chokes to keep there, the signal line. And there are seven interacting adjustments in there. <laughs> and, and if you didn't have a circulator, there were eight, because you had to put a, 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 um, a so you had to, uh, Sorry, I must have held the button down. Um, yes, there, there were uh, uh, seven or so interactive adjustments in there. Um, the, 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 you couldn't put this up at the feed point, although some people did try. Um, <laughs> not built like that. Um, uh, and so one had um, a dB's worth of feed line. So that, that loss in front of the preamp in those days was a dB, not as we're doing now, point, point 0.1 to point 0.2 of a dB. So the, the final contribution of noise is other uses of the microwave bands. And this is increasingly a problem on, on, uh, on, um, on, on 13 centimeters and on, uh, and, and on nine in some parts of the world as well. And the, all we can do about that is good low side lobes, good RF filtering, um, and, 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 <clears throat> and hope that the, uh, uh, the signal is um, Signal is loud enough to overcome it. Fortunately, I don't have that at the moment. All of these, um, all these noise contributions add up, so it's very easy uh, to work out what your system temperature is. If you know the contribution from the sky, you know the spillover, you know the loss contribution, you know the receiver contribution. You add them all together, and that's T system. Well, in fact, they're pretty actually pretty hard to to pick out. So you tend to be measuring the whole lot. So you can, you can, obviously you can separate out, um, oh, oh dear me, sorry, um, I don't know what happens, pressing, yeah, um, yeah, sorry about that, the, the loss and the receiver temperature you can, you can pull out, and the sky temperature you can pull out, the spillover, you have to really rely on somebody doing the modeling for, for that. Oh, there's a point here I meant to, I don't want to miss out, and that is that when the antenna gets down to uh, the beam width, uh, the same beam width as the, as the moon subtends, in other words, you know, roughly half a degree, then the noise, the thermal noise from the moon takes over, or tends to take over, because the moon's about 210 degrees. So the sky, so that t that T sky, you know, collapse, collapses, expands from three and a half degrees to about 200 degrees. So you know, lower noise, with a big dish on 
only three centimeters, you're not actually so worried about the uh, about the noise figure. It's quite a, there's some interesting trade-offs when you when you go up uh, up there. Well, the second equation is this one, right? And that is that ten times 0.1 of a dB equals one dB. Sometimes it equals more. Now, the reason that's there is you have to, if you want a really good system, you have to keep scraping away 0.1 of a dB off this bit, 0.1 of a dB off this bit, 0.1 of a dB off there, maybe a bit out of the feed efficiency. And by the time you've done 10 of them, you've gained a dB. And if some of those are in that area of the loss between the feed and the preamplifier, it actually will come out to more than 10 times 0.1. Because if you drop 0.1 of a dB of loss out of there, the system temperature will actually drop by more than 0.1 of a dB. So that's a, for me, that's an important thing to remember. I used to, I used to use the phrase, scrape the dB barrel clean. And I think that's still you know, another, way of, another way of looking at it. So we've got some software that will, uh, uh, that will do all these system temperature calculations for us, and in fact the whole moon budget, um, written by uh, uh, VK3 uh, UM, now sadly no longer with us. Um, that's a screenshot from it. It's easy to find. Just Google VK3 UM, um, download the software, and, um, uh, and, and learn to drive it, which isn't, isn't, it's, pretty, it's pretty intuitive. And there's a lot in it. Um, you know, there's a lot of tabs along the, along the top that do things. But it's a very good way. It tends to be used as a bit of a standard you know, between EME as a matter of VK3UM tells me this, while well, mine tells me this. And, this. and you can sort of start comparing the systems from that point on. So uh, just now to move on to the other bits of the system. We've talked about receivers, low noise amplifiers. Um, and so we've talked about antennas and, and transmitters. So really for microwaves, there's, there's really, you know, the reflector is the best antenna to have. People have made big horns, um, you know, uh, sort of two meter uh, aperture horns, um, for, but really a reflector's best. It's got a single feed point, so the losses we'll, we'll see in just a moment. So the, the, you can keep the losses low, the pattern and the polarization can be well controlled by the feed. We've now got very good uh, feed modeling from a number of, uh, a number of people. Um, Multi-band operation from one antenna. Um, so, you know, you can, you, you'll, you'll see one in a moment that goes all the way from 23 cents to three centimeters. Um, mine goes from 70, cent, 70 centimeters to six centimeters. Um, you can have prime focus, offset, cassegrain, all sorts of you know, different uh, varieties. Uh, you can make the surface solid or, or mesh, and you can build your own. You know, uh, I encourage people. There was a piece on Moon at the other side. Oh, we have a five-meter dish. Where are we going to get that from? Well, you can build the bloody thing. If <laughs> <laughs> you've got a workshop, you know, you can you can build them. Um, so a friend not very far from here built a 20-foot solid dish, solid dish, that worked up to 13 centimeters, uh, you know, GW3, x by w So, just look at a few dishes. So, I love this one. This is, this is Jodrell, as you'll know, and in the 1950s, I put some shillings in a tin at the London Beer Chef Club meetings, because it had run out of money. You read the, uh, read the story of this, uh, the, uh, uh, love the story of it. It's really, it really a work reading. Uh, the, from the sublime to the ridiculous, but not quite. Um, the Dutch are very good at fitting these little, little antennas into their tiny plots of land. And uh, this is Jan, Jan ran the last uh, uh, VHF, uh, um, sorry, Mo uh, Moonbelt's conference. And um, he also did satellite bounce with, uh, with, with this as well, off the, uh, off the ISS. Um, so in, in Holland, there's this wonderful um, dish that has been restored. If you don't know about this, it's worth just uh, go and uh, type in cameras or something like that into, into Google. It's a big dish. Uh, they get it on quite, quite often. Um, it's used also for outreach to, uh, um, to the local communities and the schools and this sort of thing. 
They've operated on all sorts of bands, multi-band feed, as you can see there. Um, they've done slow scan TV over it, um, uh, CW, JT, SSB. It's it's really it's a wonderful project, and it's a big a big help, particularly to people. Sylvia Moon Mount is almost well, it is a beacon. This is a couple of feeds um, placed at the focus of my dish, a 13 centimeter system and a 9 centimeter system. Um, and um, uh, forget about waterproofing. I left it off for the pictures. That's but not bad. It's, well, it's Tesco. That's it's waterproof by Tesco. Yeah. <laughs> What's it? Other, other plastic bags I'll still have. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so, so basically, uh, you know, th these are fairly easy to move. Uh, uh, from the uh, from the feed and replace you know, with, it, with another band, um, all the transfer. Well, I, I I'll leave that for a later slide. But um, 13 centimeters and uh, and nine centimeters, and it's a pretty quick job to uh, change uh, between them. And, uh, and that, so this is a really nice dish. This is G4CCH um, up in uh, uh, Lincolnshire. But it's, it's a, a beautiful five meter mesh dish, very fine mesh, operates very well up to up to uh, six centimeters. Um, it's I think it's point point five f to d five point four meters. John, this is yours. Um, uh, you know, uh, which uh, is is a, a, a terrific uh, effort. Um, multi band. I will get this to point right. Multi band. This is this is this is the latest score um, from 1.9 meter dish um, resurfaced, uh, you know, just like general band. I've still got scars, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, that's 1.9 meters, chaps, and that's what can be done with it. This is another way of doing it. If your neighbours don't like dishes, keep it in the garage and wheel it out when there's uh, when there's a contest. This is uh, this is uh, K1DS. With his driveway system, he's used it on uh, on 23 and 13. Um, so other types of dish, um, the offset one here, PA0JB, 2.4 meter offset. Um, all the system down the front here, well out of the way, doesn't get in the way of course on an offset dish of the of the signal. This is Brian G4 NNS's uh, Cassegrain dish. Um, used up to uh, uh, 24 gig move outs uh, done on this down to uh, uh, nine, nine centimeters. A um, little bit about transmitters. This is the old this is the old style transmitter for 23 cents which I'm still using. Um, uh, six, six tubes in a ring, 800 watts out. Howard's um, uh, four times 250 watts solid solid state uh, PA. Um, though he, he, he runs it most of the time at 500, I think. <laughs> Pretty good, anyway. Um, that's uh, that's a series of um, of um, P1 R is it RKI, RKI. yeah the modules join uh, coupled together. This is what you can do yourself. You know this is this is um, <coughs> six centimeter hundred watt PA solid state um, built by um, J4 PLC designed by um, Hannes SM6 PTP. Um, Here's um, a 24 gig system. This is uh, a DL7YC. That's his 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 focus box system. The complete system is is in there. This is the this is the um, TWT. These are TWTs which are modified uh, by taking out a, a, a sort of filter plate on the input and output probes and making a waveguide cover into them. You can give between 30 and 50 watts. Out of um, out of these, this is what I really love about all this stuff. Is you can you can actually you can change it, you can modify it, take something that doesn't really you know meant to be working at this frequency and make it work you know somewhere else. <coughs> and this is the ultimate, 76 gigahertz EME. Two only only uh, uh, echoes so far heard, but that's all. I couldn't find a picture that shows all the TWT and all the rest of it out there, but the TWTs at these frequencies are just scary. I mean, it's like 15 kb, you know. <laughs> it takes 15 kb outside on a cable. It's a remarkable, <laughs> you know, it's a remarkable guy. He really is. And, and if you want to see something really interesting, go and look 
then at microwaveclippers.org at his preamplifier. That is preamplifier. Uh, cool, a cool preamplifier. That is really something else again. <coughs> Where are we? Okay, so a quick look at system block diagram. John, look away now, because this has got transverters in it. Um, <laughs> so is mine. I'm getting that. <laughs> so, so just to just to give us some idea of what a block diagram looks like. So here we are. We'll start at the we'll start at the at the business end. Here's the feed. This is 23 centimeters. There's 400 watts going in. Three via cable loss to the to the PA. There's a driver, power supplies, obviously. There's a transverter. Um, with uh, um, an uncontrolled oscillator at 96 megs into it. Um, the output, the input and output of the transverter um, comes here, uh, is, is 144 converted down to, to 14. So, so, so it's 296 in, 144 out, 144 comes down to 14, and hanging on that is an SDR. Um, my TS850, um, uh, Spectran, and a tunable audio filter because I like CW. At the at the business end on receive, we have the relay, the isolation relay, which you can switch to a 50 ohm load. So the end, so the low noise amplifier can switch to the to the feed or to the load, and you can do that if you do that off a little switch that tells you that everything is working. If that don't, if that changes by five or six dB everything is fine. If nothing happens, then something's disconnected or the LNA is gone. Did that change? Yes. Right. So at six centimeters, you tend to end up with everything at the feed. So the transverters at the feed, uh, the driver, the SSPA, um, the, the receive side is, is the same. But the important thing, the transverters at the top. So what I do, I send the the crystal oscillator and the 144 up and down up the single up the same cable with a, with a couple of diaplexes, but the rest of it is 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 the, is the same. So operating modes, my preference is CW and SSB. Um, there's a, obviously a tremendous amount of work on on digital with the uh, all of the all of the JT modes and some some great work being done. This is a screenshot of. Um, the ARRL contest. Um, so this is about um, what is it? About um, 20 kcs of, of band with all of these all of these signals uh, coming in. We will be all the time. We won't bother with the with the audio clip. Um, but the thing I like about this this SDR is that you can actually read the CW off the screen. So you can be working somebody and watching what the opposition is doing at the same time, which is fun. So JT, this is this is what a JT screen looks like. If you've got questions on this, ask John, or uh, there's probably other people here that are familiar with, with, with JT as well. I'm not. I have it, but um, it's very very early days. But Dave, Dave's a great proponent of it as well, or user of it, I should say. Um, so finally, um, system measurement and system optimization. Well, sun noise is very useful, uh, particularly at the moment, because the sun is quiet and the noise temperature, the noise temperature, the noise level is, is pretty predictable. The quiet sun curve is is being followed um, pretty regularly uh, down to certainly at, certainly at microwave frequencies. So you can you can measure moon noise and and the uh, sorry you can measure sun noise. And the answer you get in VK3UM should be fairly fairly accurate in terms of your GNT. Moon noise, of course, is much lower, and uh, you, you 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 need a, a, a depending on frequency, you need a larger dish to see it. Um, but it can give a lot more accuracy because we know the temperature of the moon uh, pretty uh, pretty accurately. It varies, of course, with distance and phase of, of the moon. But you know, the, all of these things are. Uh, are, are known. You can use the sun to check your beam width. Just let the let it be, let it drip through. And you, you, the other thing you can do is cold sky to ground mission, I mean, it's, it, which is quite useful. But you have to watch it. It's a little bit more complex than it first appears, um, because if you when you beam your antenna set a nice hot wall, you know, two ninety degree 
a wall, well, it isn't. It, it isn't absorbing the. It isn't absorbing the the, the signal um, completely. It's reflecting some. It's, and you're seeing some cold sky reflected, and so on, so on. So you have to you have to think a little bit about it. But there's there's some stuff about that in PK3 UM and cold sky. Sorry and. As I said earlier, the VK3 um, UM program can help analyze. So here's me measuring cold sky ground on my on my three centimeter system, which is here. Um, and um, when G3SEK moved up to Scotland, they gave me a piece of three centimeter absorber, um, which is you know, from a from an helicopter chamber. So I thought, well, if I if I go outside and I hold that over the top of the uh, of the horn, that's going to that's going to give me a pretty good cold sky to to ground measurement. Uh, putting it in there, and I'll just move it up and down a little bit to to you know, deal with the deal with the reflections. And this shows what you actually get. Um, so there's about um, I think it's uh, is it five d five dB yeah five dB of change. You can see the you can see the little bit of variation along the. You can see a little bit of variation there as I'm moving it, moving it up and down. But you know, it's uh, and actually when you put the when you put the numbers into the sun, it gives 105 to 120 degrees Kelvin for that combination. So that's that's the horn plus um, a bit of spillover because there is.